Well, good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Doing well? Right on. Some of you aren't sure. <clears throat> hey, you know what? Um, actually, before we open up God's Word together, uh, I think from what I can tell reading, I think the hurricane has just kind of hit landfall. And, if I, and again, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but um, could you join me in praying with uh, just, gosh, I'd... I've never been through a hurricane, and I can't imagine what it's like to go through a hurricane, but would you pray with me for our brothers and sisters in Christ, not just for their safety, but I believe every time something bad happens, God has opportunity for his church to step in. So we're going to pray for the church, and then also, could you just join me praying for uh, Pat McCoy, he's one of our pastors here. Um, He just had uh, an operation of sorts that that just was struggling through some stuff with his kidneys, and so we'll be praying for him as well. So just just join me right now. Father, thank you so much for today. Oh, this is a day in which you've created it, you've designed it, of all the little things that happen all over the world, in spite of the fall, we believe you're a God who's in absolute control. And so right now, Father, I know that that hurricane is is hitting. (coughs) And Father, that always means there's going to be devastation. There's going to be heartache. There's going to be loss of dreams. And we do pray right now for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we do want them to be safe. But more than that, I just pray that through them, your son Jesus will be put on display in a powerful way. Would you show yourself off in the midst of suffering and heartache by a group of people whose hope is different, whose life is different, not because we're anything better than anybody else, but because of the work of Jesus Christ and the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray your church in this, whether it's in that area or your church as we dive in and the aftermath of it, would you just look good in how we engage that world? And so, Father, would you, would you grant us that? And Father, also just for Pat and for Linda as they kind of walk through what's going on in their world, would, um, would you do a work in them in such a way that all we can say is praise God, no matter what it is. We want your son to just look really good. So we ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right. Well, if you got your Bibles, open them up. <clears throat> We're going to be diving back into the book of First Peter. Um, if you remember right, we've been in this now for a few weeks. I took a few weeks. Christian took a few weeks. I thought he just did a phenomenal job in uh, unpacking so many of these truths that we're trying to understand out of the book of 1 Peter, especially, I think, just this idea of what does it mean in the midst of a fallen world to be elect exiles? That's really the question we're asking. A group of people that God has chosen to be here, even though in many ways this is not our permanent home Uh, We don't belong here. We are strangers. We are aliens. We're waiting for the new heavens and the new earth. And in the meantime, though, we're called to be a group of people that live here and represent our King Jesus extremely well. Now, one of the things that I thought was so good about what it was that Christian was able to unpack is just this idea for us that to live in this world, we are seeking to display Jesus. We're here to use this concept of tracing our lives in and around the person of Jesus. Every aspect of who we are, we, we want ourselves to be able to display Jesus how he would display himself in the world. Now, one of the things, though, that I love what he put, and let me just make sure that I get this across to everybody in here that calls themselves a follower of Jesus, you choose to follow Jesus and there will be suffering. Nobody escapes it on one end, but you proclaim the name of Jesus if you choose to live for him. The idea out of 1 Peter is how the world treated him, they're going to treat you. I think that's why so much in in this particular letter, Peter has to remind us, look, don't be surprised that the fiery trial is about to come on you. He goes, this is the normative way of looking at life. And I feel like for the last year and a half, the church has been caught up in this thing in which we're like surprised that somehow at the end of the day, there's difficulty, there's heartache. We don't get our way. Well, I would just say to all of us, including me, welcome to the real world. This is just how it is. It's how it operates. And so he just says to this precious group of people that are kind of scattered all over northern Galatia, hey, this is the normative reality for those who follow Jesus Christ. Now he goes on and he adds this, when this trial comes upon you to test you, he promised us that in 1 Peter 1, where this idea that God will test us, he will will come into our lives, he will shape us and mold us in this life through difficulty and make us into the people that God intends us to be. But don't miss this, who he intends us to be is to look like Jesus. 
And so with it, he says that he now says, rejoice insofar as Christ in Christ's suffering. So you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Now, this is where I want to just stop for just a second and talk about this idea of God's glory being revealed. One of the favorite parts of, of, of Christian stuff that he did was this idea of the victory of Jesus. Now, again, he went into this passage of Jesus. What did it mean that he was taken through this realm, you know, that, that we're not sure what it was or what was going on. But in it, he talked about this idea of the victory of Jesus. I so badly wish I could have been there at that moment when the father grabs the son and in some way begins to take him through not only human beings but the angelic realm and proclaiming victory. My son entered into death and through death defeated death and just proclaiming his victory and watching as he went through that realm. I mean, in my mind, I'm like, what in the world is that supposed to look like? Well, here's the greatest news in the world for followers of Jesus, according to 1 Corinthians 15. All of us in this room that are followers of Jesus, one day, in the person of Jesus, will stand in front of all the created realm, and our Father won't just declare victory over death and Satan and sin. He will declare victory over everything, and God's people will be over this. And I think we as followers of Jesus need to start getting excited about that. Just this idea, our king is victorious, was victorious, and will be victorious. And because he is victorious, we are overcomers. We are victors too. And so for all of us in here as followers of Jesus, I am so, maybe the word is tired of the way the church has been like, oh, look at us, woe is us, the government. Stop. Stop. Our king won, is winning, and will finally win. Now, yes, clap for Jesus. But in this, though, this is what Peter wants us to get. Is that in this life, we have to live in the reality that I don't have to win anything. We're not trying to win a fight. We're not trying to win a war. The victory has already happened. We're winning from a place of Jesus Christ already declaring victory over all things. We don't have to win anything. King Jesus is settling that all. We just need to be faithful. Just be faithful followers of Jesus. He goes on and he talks about this idea, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you should be happy. No, not if you're one of those jerks that's out there trying to get insulted. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about just the reality of living in a world like this. People are going to look at us like we're strange. There's this guy that I've been sharing Christ with, and totally neat guy, and I made sure that he wasn't here this morning because then I'd feel funny, but he's totally, I've so loved getting to know him. He's a guy that does not believe in Jesus. Um, he's a guy politically probably on a completely different side than me, I would say. He's probably pretty good, like, friends, kind of with, like, a Bernie Sanders kind of person. And I don't fit well on the Republican or the Democrat side, but I don't, you know, we're just sitting there talking about the victory of Jesus. And, and all of a sudden, he looks at me like this. He goes, man, Todd, he goes, it's weird. I'm sitting here talking to you, and you seem so intelligent, but yet you're a Christian. <laughs> He goes, oh, I'm sorry. I go, no, it's okay. Now, again, that's kind of a funny illustration, isn't it? But I think that's how the world sometimes views us. We're just weird. We're strange. How can you believe something like that? But in that day when King Jesus declares his victory for the final time, we will not seem strange. And I think that's why he says, look, that this, because of this, the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. In fact, I would say this, we were designed to do this. We were designed to live in the world this way. But now make sure, he says, not let any of you to suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. I love this one. It's like murder, thief, evildoer, or a meddler. <laughs> not the meddler, you know, as if that's somehow a, a super evil villain inside of DC Comics. But who are you? I'm the meddler, right? But the idea of a meddler is one who involves himself in stuff that doesn't matter, that you have no control over. See, we live again in a world, this is not our home. 
We are to do the things that Jesus Christ has called us to do and nothing else. We need to quit meddling. We need to engage ourselves in the things God calls us to, but I'll tell you what, I feel like so often the church engages itself in things where God's like, why in the world are you getting involved in that? I never asked you to do that. I asked you through the power and the victory of Jesus and in and through the Holy Spirit to go and bring the greatest message ever of Jesus Christ. I ask you to go in amongst those that are the least of these, those that have been marginalized, those that are in particularly difficult positions. I've asked you to go where no one else wants to go. And all these other things you do, why are you meddling? Don't waste your time. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But let him glorify in that name. Make it about Jesus. Now here's where it kind of gets good, where we're going to be going this morning. It's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. Now, what in the world does that mean? I think so often we look out at the world and we're thinking that God is somehow judging the world, and he is. And let me tell you this, we'll learn that he will finally judge the world in absolute righteousness, in absolute uh, righteous, not only justice, But for right now, we see this concept where Peter lays out, though, that he's judging the church. Well, what does that mean? Well, one of the places we're going to go today is the book of Ezekiel. So if you haven't been in Ezekiel much, congratulations. You're about ready to get to go there this morning. But there's another side of it. Let me just kind of fill you in how Jesus would talk about it. In and amongst God's church right now, God is doing a work where he is revealing those that are his and those that aren't. You might see it as like the wheat and the tares that Jesus talks about. You might see it the wheat and the chaff. But the idea is is that God is going to bring pressure upon his church. And let me just say this to you. When we look at like the soils, you know, there's the four different soils. The one where they threw seed on and the birds came and ate it. The soil that was shallow that, you know, went up. And and because of the heat, it began to die. The, the, The soil that had weeds on it, it choked it out. And then there was that good soil. Right now, like every other time, God is bringing trial and test to bear upon the church And the hardest part is is that people will walk away. Now, I think they walk away from different reasons and in different times and in different places. They're they're, they're doing it with, with, with all kinds of different motives. But in this, Jesus wants us to know that he is going to test his church. Now, in testing his church, you see this. He also said it's not only just the household of God, if it begins with us, And I was thinking through this and praying through this this week. What will be the outcome for those who don't obey the gospel of God? He then quotes Proverbs 11 where it says, And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? I can't even begin to imagine in the end when finally God's wrath comes to bear, his justice that's being held back in so many ways is going to be poured out upon the earth in absolute righteousness. But he's saying to them in one way, though, that's not where his judgment is taking place necessarily right now. It's happening inside of his church. He's he's sorting it through. He's, He's purifying it. And he says then in verse 19, and I think this is the pinnacle of what he's talking about in everything that I preached on and everything that Christian preached on. Therefore, based upon everything I've just said, which I think goes all the way back to chapter 1, Let those who suffer according to God's will, let those who suffer as ones who, who, chapter 2, verse 21, are ones that are following in the footsteps of Jesus, who are tracing our life after him, just entrust your souls to a faithful creator while doing good. It's what Jesus did with the Father. It says he entrusted himself to him. See, I think right now, more than anything, what we need as the church is just to trust that we, God, is in control of all things. He not only created, but he's recreating. And let me just say this, I believe, and I've said this over and over and over for the last year and a half, and I'm gonna keep saying it. We were created for this time. This is the time God designed that we would walk in. This is the place we've been asked to be faithful in. This is the the exact circumstances that we were shaped and molded throughout these last few years to be ready for. And now what he's saying is, is step into it. But the question we ask is how? How do I do it? Not only that, I don't want to keep doing good. This is hard. 
I was listening to my wife this morning. We were kind of talking through this passage with a group of people. And she was just talking about how hard and difficult this is. I know it is. But isn't it interesting that we think it's hard until we start praying for our brothers and sisters of Christ right now in Afghanistan? What we're going through right now is like whether we should wear a mask or not. They're wrestling through life and death. And what it means there to stand for Jesus Christ. But in the coolest way, in the same way we were designed in our time and place, this is what I love. Our great creator God, who has ordained all things, and according to Acts 17, he has placed people within the confines of every place in the world. Those precious brothers and sisters in Christ that are right now in Afghanistan, that time and place was designed for them. And now just like we're going to entrust ourselves to this great creator God, they too can entrust themselves. But again, how are we going to do it? Well, here's where Peter's going to go. He's going to talk about two groups of people coming up. He's going to talk about the elders and the youngers. Okay, just, just for a second, just go with me. We'll start with each of them. We'll go to the other. But he's going to start talking about how the church needs one another. We need each other to go through what's going on in the world right now. And in order to do this tracing that that Christian had been talking about of our lives after Jesus Christ, he's saying this is this kind of dance that the two of you need to do, but I don't want you to miss in all of it. Whatever goes on, whether we're talking about these elders or these youngers, it is all designed to point to one person, Jesus Christ. Now here's what he says. He says, so, and that word is just therefore, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, in other words, as also one who's an elder, and we'll talk about what this means in a second, and a witness, and in this case, it's not so much someone who saw Jesus Christ, but one who shows off or, or demonstrates, models the sufferings of Christ. Peter says, if you saw Christ, you've, you've seen Christ in me, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed, and here's what he tells these elders to do, shepherd the flock of God that's among you. Now, who are these elders? Well, the elders, and a lot of times, whenever we talk about this throughout Scripture, the elders are just the normal leadership within a church. Cornerstone has elders. At this point right now, we have five elders. It'll drift anywhere from five up to, I think, the most we've had is somewhere around 12 or 13. I can't even remember But there's just times in which he's talking about this group that's the normal leadership that's talked about like in 1 Timothy and Titus. It's those people that God has called in stewardship and asked them to give oversight, because you'll see that word down in verse 2 as well, to give oversight over the church. What the elders are supposed to do, and specifically when you look down at this, shepherd the flock of God amongst us, they're supposed to shepherd people. They're to care for the people. They're to, to feed the people. They're to protect the people. This, when you look at it, is their key role. Now, let me, let me just speak to something for just a second, because again, I'm talking now about me, and I need, I need you to pray for me and all the other elders and pastors that are part of Cornerstone. We are not, first and foremost, CEOs of a tax-exempt organization. Tax-exempt status is not who we are. We are not first and foremost that. This is a family. This is a flock. And it does not belong to me. It does not belong to the rest of the elders. This family was purchased with the very blood of Jesus Christ. We are not a business. We are instead an entity that was created by God himself. I'm not a sheriff. It's not my job to come moseying into town with my guns and tell everybody what to do and shoot off my bullets. I'm not a cowboy that's supposed to go and rustle the doggies and drive the cattle. I'm not a guru bringing down truths from on high to the rest of you. I'm not a social influencer. I'm not a professor. What Peter says to this precious group of people alongside of them, you shepherd. That's what you do. Now there's huge implications in behind that. Because he says in there, down in verse two, he says, look, these shepherds, what they do is they give oversight. 
They oversee things. They, they watch over. They're, they're ones who the chief shepherd, they're the, they, they follow after the chief shepherd. You'll see this in like chapter two of ones that look over the church in this special way to make sure all is accounted for. But let me just tell you this, as one who's had to wrestle for the last year or year and a half how to shepherd a church through difficulty and heartache and all the things that came along with the last one, I know also that to be one who is an overseer, I know I'm gonna be accountable to God one day. In 1 Corinthians 3, it talks about it, and I won't go into it, but there's this way in which all the elders are going to stand there, and somehow the, the judgment of God is going to come to bear, and we're going to find out whether it's gold and, or silver or precious stones or wood, hay, and stubble. He wants these shepherds to know that it is a call on their life to come and to steward his grace into it, but I will give an answer along with the other elders and shepherds. My kids the other day were fighting in the car over who's the boss of Cornerstone. They said, now that Terry has left, who's in charge? <laughs> And we sat and talked through that no one of us is in charge. The Bible never gives complete authority to any one man or woman inside of a church. The one in charge is Jesus Christ. So every aspect of this, he wants them to know we will give an account. Now, he gets this from Ezekiel 8. Now, remember I told you we're going to be going to the book of Ezekiel so you can see this because I want you to know how to pray for me, how to hold me accountable along with the other elders, but also for many of you in here, I believe that God also is potentially calling you to be an elder within our church, and we'll, we'll talk more about that in the fall. But in the book of Ezekiel, he's talking about this idea of God's judgment being brought to bear, and in verse 6, he says, and begin at my sanctuary. Look what he says there. So they began with the elders who were before the house. Here's the thing that we have to get. God's judgment is always going to start with the elders. Now you're going to see this in there. The first Peter is going to connect this too. He's going to basically re-say the same thing. He says it's time for judgment to begin at the household of God. So I exhort the elders among you. He, he's just repeating in a lot of ways what Ezekiel has just said. It's a very similar thing. He's taking it from the Old Testament into the New Testament. Now, what does that mean? I think what it means is in the coming years, so many are saying, you know, I just feel like this world's about ready to get very difficult. And in getting very difficult, I believe that at the front of it, the most vulnerable to persecution are going to be the leaders within the church. They are the ones that you see throughout church history. You see it in the early days of the church with Peter and James and Stephen. You see in there that the church is going to come to bear and it's going to be a fire, and a, just a difficulty brought upon it. And here's the thing we're going to learn is that pastors are going to walk away. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention over the last three, four, five years, but have you noticed how many pastors are walking away from the ministry? It's crazy. But I think this is really what he's talking about here is that when, when this comes upon you, in 2 Timothy, you will see this. They either quit or they were exposed. But the way you can be praying for me, the rest of the elders, is that it is dangerous to be a leader. I get it we're not in Afghanistan. I understand that we're not somehow standing and our life at this point is in danger. But I really do believe there's something going on here and the Bible also, I think, is saying it, is that we will be tested for our authenticity. We'll be made, in some way, found out to be who we really are. I can come in front of you all I want, and I can play a game. I can pretend to be this super spiritual follower of Jesus. I can bring on these amazing truths from down high. But at the end of the day, God loves his church enough that he will expose leaders. He will show them to be frauds. Not because he doesn't love his church, but because our God will purify his church. Now in this, what you see, especially when you get into verse one, and he talks about this idea of shepherding the flock of God amongst them. In verse two, then he goes on, and he talks about this idea of exercising oversight. He's gonna explain now 
What is it about these leaders that we should be looking at and understanding? Who, what is it that I am as a leader or the other elders, the other pastors supposed to be looking towards? Who are we supposed to be? Well, he's going to connect this idea of some not statements and some but statements. Look down in verses 2 and 3. Do you see that down in there? He says, not under compulsion, but willingly. Uh, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering, but being example. So he's going to use this idea. Now, here's the three things I want you to see. Who leaders are is we don't do this out of duty, we don't do this out of greed, and we don't do this with power for power and prestige. We do it the exact opposite when we're tracing our lives. Jesus didn't do what he did for duty. In Hebrews 12 it said, for the joy set before him he endured the cross. Jesus didn't do it to make money, he already had everything. Jesus didn't do it for power and prestige, he already had all authority in heaven and on earth. And now leaders are supposed to do it the same way. Now watch, watch what he does here. Look down in verse 2. He says, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. Now the idea of compulsion is, is that you're being, you're being forced to do something. And so yesterday at my house, I had, I had chores to do, and I came in, and I walked into all my children, and I could care less what their idea of what they were doing with that day was. I was compelling them to do chores around the house. They were doing it out of compulsion. But in this particular case, though, what happens to leaders that come in and shepherd when they're doing it under compulsion? Well, if you got your Bibles, open up to John 10. Let me me kind of show you what I'm talking about. What is the danger of a leader doing it under compulsion? Look, Look at John 10. Specifically, look at verse 12. He says this. <clears throat> he says, he who is a hired hand or one who's in doing it under compulsion, he's not a shepherd. <laughs> Who does not own the sheep, leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he cares nothing for the sheep. So what is it that I as a leader and what is it that you should now be looking at and praying for me and the other leaders? What should you be asking for? Not that we would do it out of duty, but because we love God and we love you. I say it over and over again because I want you to know this. I love this church. I love that we live in Simi Valley. I remember the first time somebody said to me, a guy named Doug Fox, who was a pastor here, he said, have you ever thought about coming over and being a shepherd at a place called Simi Valley? Well, the only time I had ever heard of Simi Valley before this was the movie Joe Dirt. (laughs) Pretty similar. I didn't know if I could love this place. I love this town. I love that it's changing. I love that it's looking different. I look out over this group of people and you ask me, why do I love you? Because the Bible has reminded me, I love you because Jesus Christ first loved you. My father, you are my brothers and sisters, absolutely adores you. And I have to keep that in front of me. I have to keep that at the forefront because if I'm not careful as a leader, I will start doing this out of duty, not out of love. And anytime anybody does it out of duty, the moment that wolves come in, he runs away and the sheep are scattered. So pray for us. That's the first thing he talks about. Here's the second thing that I think that it's kind of important in there. Is he's now going to bring in this idea of not for shameful gain. But, he says in there, eagerly. Now let me take you back to the, to the book of, of Ezekiel. Look at chapter 8, verse 12. Now this is where it starts to get dark. In this, he, he's, he's talking, and God is talking to Ezekiel. He says, son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel are doing? Look at this. In the dark. Each in his room of pictures. The idea is, is this chamber of idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. In other words they start to think that there's no longer somebody to give an account to. Now watch what they do. Chapter 34. 
The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, odd shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves should not, should, oh, excuse me, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. What's he saying there? The moment somebody doesn't love the sheep to which God has entrusted them with, pretty soon he will start using the sheep for his own ends. He will start fleecing the sheep of the money that they have to be able to absorb it into himself. And if you don't believe me, watch all the things that go on on TV. One after one. And in fact, if you're somebody here that that is not a believer, I bet you somewhere in there you're not a follower of Jesus because you're worried that we're going to take your money and use it in some way. And that's the only thing that we want from you. And let me just tell you, shepherds can go here. Pretty soon, they're not really caring for you. They just care for you for what you can give to them. And in this particular reality, as he's talking about them, he, he's making sure that these leaders understand that's not who we are. We don't do it out of, a, out of duty. We do it out of love. We don't do it to try to get things from people. We instead, and I love this word, is we do it eagerly. That word eagerly literally means this idea of we do it. Whether you pay me or not, I will do it. I believe firmly within my gut, all of the, the paid pastors, elders, and cornerstone, whether you pay us or not, we're still going to keep shepherding people. But he says in there, watch out. These people need to be, and I think here's another word, called. But in verse 3, he, he adds another one in there that I think is important. Did I skip over it? I did. Let me get back there. Verse 3, wrong one. Talk amongst yourselves about your favorite football team, like the Steelers. There we go. Verse 3. He throws in a second knot. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. What's this third one? If the first one is duty and the second one is greed, the third one is power. It's these people that love power. They love prestige. They love dominance. Especially they love their image. They love to be up front. They love to have titles. They love to get the praise of men. They love to look smart. But at the end of the day, the way that we see it here is they're just despots. They're politicians. They're people that act like wounded heroes. They have a Messiah complex, but at the end of it, they're not to be the Messiah. This group of people instead is to be examples to the flock. They're to point to King Jesus. My heart for me and all the other elders and shepherds that call Cornerstone home is that you won't look to us for your salvation. You won't look to us as the ones that somehow are going to pull you out of that dark moment. Our hope is is that in coming to us, we will point you to the very one who can actually deal with all things, King Jesus. But over and over again, I've watched it as people that I know and as I love They've gotten to this point where they love to be up front and preach. They love to be in these places of honor. They love to be told how great they are and how much they helped me. But really at the end of it, what he's saying here is is we don't model ourselves, we model the king. Let me just talk about this last year because I've kind of avoided some aspects talking about my personal life, but I'm just going to talk about it right here. I totally understand people have left Cornerstone. I understand it. It's been heartache, but then I've also watched a ton of you. There's so many of you right now that are in here that I don't even know who you are, and so if I haven't introduced myself, hi, I'm Todd. My heart all over this last year has not been to be a pastor that I'm making a name for myself, nor the other pastors. My heart has not been to try to make things easier on you or to tell you what you want to hear. In 2 Timothy 4, it talks about this idea that there will come a time in which pastors will find those tickling ears. And what the tickling ears wanted to hear over the last year was, is exactly politics. They wanted to hear, I can do whatever I want to do. I'm in charge of my life. I have rights and freedoms. And I'm trying to tell you, those things are so secondary to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I am here as a shepherd in your life, and I promise you, based upon the grace of God, nothing in Todd whatsoever. 
We cannot start going down the path where we just make the Bible say what we want to say. The Bible has called us to submit to authorities over us. The only time we don't submit to them is if they forbid something that God's commanded or command something God's forbidden. And if it doesn't do that, we submit. And I'm not going to tickle your ears and say, oh, here's a reason why we wouldn't, or here's a reason why we're there going to do that. No. No. You don't want a liar for a pastor. I hope you always want someone who's going to tell you the truth about God's word. And there are hucksters out there that are telling things somehow, somehow, in some way that you could do all those things. And I'm trying to tell you, we're not reading the same Bible. Sorry, I didn't mean to go down there. I think there's just this side of it where it's just so heartbreaking to watch people walk away from Cornerstone over some of the most silly things. And I love them. As I called so many of them, proclaiming my love, having walked through different things. But by the grace of God, the wisdom of God, my intent is to not veer from the word of God is to walk in the way God's called us even when it's difficult. In fact, not even when, but when it is difficult. Why? Because we're tracing the king. How we walk through this proclaims to the world something powerful. When we walk through in the way God's called us to walk through, oh, brothers and sisters in Christ, It is a loud voice proclaiming, this is what our king is like. And we'll come back to verse four, but now let me talk about everyone else. Verse five. Likewise, similar to what I've just said, Peter's saying, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Now, the first term elders is no doubt it's a position because he talks about shepherding a role that he played, but what in the world does this younger mean? Well, the word younger can mean multiple things. It's this this Greek word that means new or or, or someone that 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 is infantile or maybe even someone that is young in the faith is kind of what it's talking about. It's speaking of an assumption. In the same way that these elders are called to be leaders within the church, the, the younger that are down here, they're called to now come underneath those elders in a powerful way to follow them into what God's called them to do. What that means is, as I would just say this, it's just the rest of the church. The rest of the church following after the elders. Now that word subject there, is, it's similar to every time that Peter's used it throughout the book of 1 Peter. It just means this willingness to be persuaded, to be led. We'll follow you wherever you take us, again, as long as you take us in a biblical path. Where are you taking us? We'll follow I've talked to so many that are sitting here today. I've loved it. There's so many amazing people that have come up and said, look, we're just, we're confused. We're trying to understand, but we're we're trying to follow. We want to follow you, but help us get it. I love that our church has been noble Bereans. They've been seeking the scriptures daily to see if what Todd and Christian and Terry and everyone else is saying the truth. I'm not asking in this church for blind trust. That's the last thing I want because I know myself. There's this side of it, though, within this church that, gosh, dang it if, it, if we don't somehow do something that forbids what God commands or command what God forbids, this willingness to just say, I'll follow you. I'm with you. Why? Well, I think it points to this amazing thing. In this dance of the church with the leaders and the congregation, as one stands before God ready to give an account but is going to sacrificially hopefully give his life for the sheep, the sheep then come alongside and it's this beautiful dance where everything points to Jesus Christ. To be subject is actually to model after Jesus. In chapter 2 it says that the son submitted himself. The world will never know what submission is until the church shows them what submission is. But then for those of us that are leaders, the world will never know how authority is supposed to be handled until we handle that authority like Jesus. I am not Jesus. (laughs) But I'm asked to handle that authority like him. And in all of this, it's to be a dance 
chapter 3, verse 15, that the world might ask an answer for the hope that's found within us. We don't get you. How is it that those leaders there, they care about the people, that they sacrifice for them, they, they come underneath them, they teach them, they walk with them, they walk over, watch over false doctrine. How is it that they do that? Oh my gosh, what's the hope that's within them? And then those people, the way they, they subject themselves to them and the, the way that works together in such harmony, how do they do it? In verse five, I know how it happens. It's a group of people that humble themselves towards one another. We're just caring. But it's not without a reason. And this is where I wanted to get this to chapter four. Why do we do this dance? Jesus Christ is coming back. Let me say that again. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I'm here to tell you Jesus Christ is coming back. He will reign and rule over all things. He will judge between those who are in Christ and those who are not in Christ. There are people in here that will spend an eternity apart from him and those that will spend eternity with him. But when our king comes back and he is made present in front of all the created realm, those of us that are in Christ, I promise you, we will not regret in the least following King Jesus with our entire lives. There will be trumpets, there will be shouts, there will be proclamations. And in all of this moment and in everything that's going on, our King, Jesus Christ, will be presented before the Father with all of us who have been made clean and perfect through the work of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we will receive the Stephanos, the crown that is an unfading glory of proclamation. And in that moment, I promise you, you will not regret it. We might be exiles now. Oh, but brothers and sisters, our home, our future home is amazing. We don't have to grow weary in well-doing. We can do this dance. Those of you that are shepherds and pastors in here that are alongside of me, we will give an account. Let's not do it out of duty. Let's not do it from a sense of somehow you know, doing it for money or doing it for power or prestige. Let's just be the shepherds that God's called us to be. Let's Philippians 2 have the humility to come alongside. Let's, let's dive into the lives of people. And I am so tired as so many people begin to exit Simi Valley. There is so much gospel potential still here and people that are going to be rescued. Don't quit. And for those of you that do know Jesus Christ that are now followers that are coming underneath our leadership, let me say this. Thanks for staying with us. Oh, it's been a rough road, hasn't it? But I look around this room. There's enough power in this room under the Holy Spirit to transform a city. There's probably around 80 to 90,000 people that don't know Jesus Christ. And we now, along with all the other amazing churches in Simi Valley that call Jesus Christ the Lord, that understand the truths of God's word, oh, the mission is still alive and well, but it's not done through power and prestige and arrogance and screaming and yelling. It's done as humble servants in a dance of the church, proclaiming King Jesus is victorious. And so my heart as an elder, as one that loves you, I'll go back to where I started. This is our time. This is our place. This is the moment that God has brought us into. Let's go be elect exiles. And all God's people said, God bless you.